please. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Let me check if you can hear me. Can you? Yeah. Is it is it okay? Um. Okay. So we start. So uh, my name is Sergey Akinchuk. Thank you for introduction. I'm really happy uh, to be invited and to have a great audience here. It's uh, uh, nice is that we are not full, so you can, by the way, stop and interrupt me because we are like uh, in tiny mode. Uh, or if you have any questions, just park them. And then you have you have a space for questions. Uh, Otherwise, don't be shy. Just raise a hand, because otherwise you forget and I forget. Mm. I'm a co-founder and, and CEO of Talsec, uh, the mobile security company. Um, today, um, it's going to be a little bit... Uh, just, I'll try to challenge conceptual approach to uh, mobile security a little bit, because... Uh, when I uh, started the business, um, I started to rethink security uh, and was just thinking a little bit what is security about and what do we do and how does it work, how this business works actually. Um, and today you might have, uh, it's not, it's not going to be very technical, uh, it's a very tiny, a little bit, but today you might have some maybe ideas insights, I, I shared like my, my just thoughts or, or mind flow. Uh, and it can be useful for those who are um, designing apps uh, or considering uh, to create app for business or to switch to, to mobile and define requirements, define security architecture and security requirements for the apps. Mm. Yeah, so w when I started uh, this business, I, I started this rethinking and analyzing market. And uh, one, one, some statistics seem to me a little bit strange. So the investments uh, is, is like hyping uh, for a long period of time. It's growing, growing, growing exponentially. Uh, but the effect of it is kind of negative. So the, the losses are also growing exponentially. So it seemed a little bit like, uh, or it just remind me, um, uh, it's kind of be solving the wrong problem. Or I, I, I just recall the joke about uh, engineering bias. It's like we are used to, and we as engineers, oh, by the way, how many business people, are pure business people? Are there anybody? Very few. Right? How many technical people? So more. Okay. So we are more like engineers. Uh, so and we as engineers, uh, we have our bias. So you know, we uh, we love solve technical problems, uh, and especially well defined technical problems, and we like intuitively avoid this kind of vague. Uh, problem statement. So we feel much comfortable uh, with, the, with the problems which are we have, especially with the problems which we have solution for. We know how to, to solve, and and we when we have a field of problems, we intuitively pick those we we know how how we're gonna solve. We have technology for that, where it's kind of easy easy to grasp. Um, so th this is actually what, what is engineering bias about. But um, there is also kind of classical mistake uh, technical people does often that we uh, we jump very quickly to solutions. So we not invest enough uh, to problem definition and just looking at the problem from different prospects. So we we, we really love to. Uh, think about solutions and not not to get stuck in problems, which is usually uh, which is very often like root cause of many many mistakes. And uh, this we we as a technicians needs to learn uh, a little bit to stay 
in calm and, and, and uh, elaborate a little bit longer than just start coding. Um, because we love coding. We love, to, we love, we love uh, uh, technology. But we need to realize that uh, on the dark side of the power, the cyber criminals, they're very pragmatic people and they are not really, uh, they don't necessarily technology funds, they are rather technology consumers. They, they use necessary minimum technology to reach the goal they have. And their goal is not technical. Their goal, another one, it can be financial, it can be disruptive, but it's not technical goal. So, uh, so they, they approach the problem from different side and they're not, um, that obsessed with, uh, or obsessed maybe bad word, but this is the way uh, we feel ourselves sometimes with technology and uh, yeah, the excitement about technology and all that. Um, okay. Some of you may say, okay, um, yeah, well, and one example of that uh, is, uh, for example, quantum computing. So I don't believe the um, all the cyber criminals uh, immediately jump on breaking a RSI algorithm with quantum computing just because it's possible, while social engineering and phishing still works well. Um, so the point is that technology is instrumental. Uh, and, and, and the goal is not technological. So, you may say, okay, uh, I know Sergey where you're pointing at. Um, social engineering, phishing, scams, all that. It's, a, it's actually not that much technical issues. These are users' mistakes. It's educational problems. It's a problem of, I don't know, media, schools, government, whatever. This is partially true. But uh, I don't think it can be fully solved. These problems cannot be fully solved by schools, government, and media. First of all, because the uh, attack vectors, dynamics, uh, and, uh, and velocity of creation is uh, they, so quick that none educational cycle can, can manage uh, to include these things uh, in, the, in the educational uh, program. Um, another, another, another reason is that it's very context-based, context-bound or use-case-based. The attack vectors are very use-case-based. So nobody can better provide a, a remedy like uh, best practice information or educational hints how to detect suspicious activity, how to um, uh, recognize the scam. Nobody but uh, app issuer, nobody but business who is just running running this use case. So um, I'm I'm actually uh, uh, probably jumped over this guy, uh, this slide, but you, you you probably know that. Yeah. So the statistics is still is still like uh, clear about that. that human mistakes is is today. Is the uh, most popular reason. The most of breaches, most of money stolen from account, are stolen with, the, with some mistake of the end user. This or that mistake. But um, it, it just indicates that we cannot fully resolve this problem by just technical uh, solution. Or, or do we? Or if we can still do something with it. Right, so this is actually uh, an open question, and uh, we will elaborate on this a little bit. And if it's at all our our job to to tackle this, so if it's if you should include it in a scope, uh, uses mistakes. So what I suggest is to look at cybersecurity as a chain. Yeah, so and. It seems statistics statistics says that okay, users mistakes probably is the weakest link in this chain, and um, for some use cases, for some businesses, is definitely true from like, from what I see. 
It's definitely true, for example, for fintechs, for mobile banking, where yeah, a lot of a lot of efforts and scam efforts are focused on on finding weak or vulnerable segment of users and misuse their their missing skills, their devices, or whatever. So, use if if it is true, if you accept that this is the weakest link, then um, if you want to see effect of or improvement in, in security chain, we need to start from the weakest link. Yeah, and uh, it is actually recognized somewhat of the current version of uh, last mass and uh, yeah so um, we have one requirement uh, which is not purely technical addressing this bottleneck problem and hundreds requirements about architecture and technical issues um, yeah, it's just a side remark, and uh, I, I hope uh, this this idea will be traced in, in the future evolution of mass standards, or maybe some other standard, or somehow some somehow reference to the right um, right um, I don't know framework where this topic should be addressed. And I and I am happy that uh, OWASP is really at least some, somewhat recognizing this this as a problem which needs to be addressed. Um, okay, so if if we want to to tackle this user's mistakes, so it's inevitable. So we definitely need to try to um, look at this issue through through the lens of users. So we need to include their point of view to our uh, subject matter to to the scope of our elaboration. Um, and avoid our technology bias or te technical bias. So the best, the best um, methodology for avoiding bias that uh, people know today is probably philosophy. That's why I try to use some philosophical um, approach, let's say, to, to this to this subject um, to just use this uh, as a framework. So, in, in first, we need to agree on terms. Try to agree on terms. Um, and uh, first simple term is security. Yeah, so, what is security? It's kind of obvious thing for us. It's something good. Security is a good system, a secure system. And we are, as a, as a security experts, we are like, what to think about. Uh, but... I tell you that it's absolutely differently taken by average average end user. It has uh, this negative or kind of element of discomfort in this word security. It's definitely linked to some discomfort or fear to make a mistake, uh, discomfort of some restrictions. I need to, I don't know, remember longer passwords. I need to do another step with OTP. I need to use it only one device, not two, or uh, uh, when I'm in another country, uh, I have trouble. So it's always coming with some discomfort. I know, it, is there anybody who never blocked a banking card for the wrong pins? Yeah. Uh, I don't know, I, I did it try triple times. So this kind of a discomfort from security measures is kind of, um, it's nat natural, natural for security. And this, this negativity is actually coming from, uh, by design, security is limitation, uh, comes with limitation of freedom of rights. It, it is by definition. Um, and um, end users, for them, I can tell you, the uh, average um, perception of security uh, is a is a, like necessary evil. This is average perception of security. It's necessary evil, and I can tell you if, if anybody here uh, ever sell security solutions to, to big corporations, uh, you may experience um, that this approach, this perception, 
to security as necessary evil is also belongs to top management or marketing people. Is something is bothering, uh, expensive, and doesn't have a direct link into revenue. And when you sell uh, security solutions, you sometimes feel like a necessary evil advocate. And um, yeah, this is our, this is our kind of piece of our job. But uh, yeah, this is how it is perceived. Uh, what is important uh, to note is that for for end users, uh, the security is actually um, the act, uh, objective or real level of security of the valve solution, especially, is really hidden. They they actually don't know and, they, and, and don't have a clue and, and they don't care. Actually, they just presume you are good. You do what you have to do. Uh, what, but what they really have access to is, is safety. This is their individual feeling. Safety is, it has another word. It's a, has another, another meaning a little bit. So it links, it's linked to individual perception. It's like feeling safe. Yeah, if I do feel safe or I don't, not, don't feel safe. It's my individual feeling. So I don't know if, if I really secure or not, but I feel safe or not. So I can feel safe. In insecure situation, if I don't know, or I have some skills and I, uh, I'm okay. Um, so you see, uh, it can be different, and moreover, they can be they can contradict each other. Each other. So some security measures can harm safety feelings, like surveillance, video monitoring. Many people don't feel comfortable under monitoring and don't feel safe. Actually, uh, due to security measure, some people don't feel safe due to machine learning profiling uh, of the users, uh, machine learning detection, risk scoring, and all these technologies. They just don't like this. They don't feel comfortable. They don't feel safe because their data somehow used to train some evil machine. Um, so here. We agreed that there are two two worlds: individual perception by user. It's like more the users more about safety, and the only thing they can feel and, and, and grasp they can go not grasp security. Uh, and this safety is is actually about balance, about balance or equilibrium, about this freedom and security. Yeah. So they some people feel feel comfortable to delegate um, part of their freedom. To somebody for some higher power that will uh, take care of us. And actually, we are entering entering the social, the, the philosophical concept from Middle Ages, uh, which is uh, called social contract. An idea, a basic idea that um, the social contract is when. You delegate part of your freedom to some higher power that take care of your security, but takes from you part of your freedom or privacy. In our in our let's say daily life, in our normal life, physical life, we are we experience it in relations with our governments, uh, which give us police, army, whatever. But um, but we can somewhat influence. So this social contract can be adjusted by us as a, as a population, as people, as citizens, um, through the voting mechanism, yeah? through the elections. It works imperfect. It has five-year lag. It is vulnerable to manipulation, to I don't know, fake news. But it works. Um, so what do we have in our digital world? You may say, like, cookies, GDPR. This is where we adjust our social contract, right? These ugly pop-ups on every website where you can define something um, like balance between freedom, or privacy, and security. 
features. It's a night kind of nightmare. I just wait where some smart person writes some in a WASP or out outside of a WASP standard that this this fine tunings and definition of my preferences can be in browser and taken by website. And I don't have to put this stuff again and again in every website. I hope it's happen someday. Uh, because it's nonsense. It should how how is this implemented? Just like isn't it fun? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know why to say are so long. But okay, GDP, it's, GDPR was a push, right? But um, but it's too long. It's, it could be solved. It should be solved. Yes. But again, standard would be nice. Idea. Yeah. It would be. You would make a big, big contribution to my personal um, quality of life. Maybe, but that's a separate topic. Again, I'm, I'm not a, a subject matter expert on that, uh, but I need, you need to think about it, how to tackle it. It just should not stay for long. Right? Um, okay, well, but what about apps more? What do we have in apps? In apps, situation is even worse. So we are, uh, we are just able to only see no, be, be notified kind of before installation if you go somewhere in the privacy section and see and install or not install the app. So it's, it's not soft at all. And you, you see, I just mentioned apps world. So did you, did you notice how quick we switch to apps world? So today people are solving 80% of online time in apps, not in web browsers. So I didn't notice when did it happen. During several years, uh, online is in apps today. And apps, majority of apps are still vulnerable. Um, one of the reasons, I think it's again, because of this quick switch and majority of our security design architecture were like designed for web and extrapolated to app. But app's architecture is somewhat different than browser. And uh, yeah, security architecture of apps work is yet to be to be improved to my opinion. Uh, we are not yet there. Yeah, so um, there is still a lot of space uh, for improvement. Um, yeah, but so if you are in apps world and we're back to our topic, we, we were thinking about how to help users make less mistakes. So, and let's try to make a philosophical exercise, like thought experiment. Like imagine the apps world where every app is like a castle. Um, and it's isolated, it works in a sandbox, so it's like Castle. It has a picture like Castle Lord or something owner. And users are teleporting from one Castle to another very quickly and spend their 80% of their lifetime, spend their time and money. And these apps are competing for this attention. And this is like, let's say, middle age. Uh, environment. So it is full of violence and danger and uh, viruses, malwares, um, cyber criminals, uh, government uh, agencies attacking each other, etc. So it's a vulnerable environment. And there are, there are kind of two, in this, in this case we would have two civilizations. It's like a uh, iOS Kingdom and Android in Union. In iOS, it's like more uh, direct and straightforward, or this kind of governments of securities 
a little bit simpler. And Android is a little bit more messy and fragmented. Um, but it is what, what we have. Um, in such, so what, uh, in, in such a world, right? So, what would we do as, uh, what would we do and how would we fail as um, cost of owners? How would we help our users and to, to suffer from cybersecurity problems. First of all, we would be thinking about this dilemma about safety and security. Yeah? Either to make it more uh, to focus on the user's perspective about his feeling of safety or just do some hardcore security not necessarily uh, making users happy. I think in, in this in this middle age world, in this apps world, you would I would bet from safety because I need these citizens. The more citizens I have, the stronger my customer. The more money I have, the more money I have, the more econ the better my economy, the more resources I can invest to security. Just from this prospect, and I live there, so we're like for the matter of uh, uh, self uh, self security, the, the, in the better people around you, the sec more secure you are. So you definitely go for trying to make users feel safe, safer. Okay, now so we are users in this in this age. So how would we? How would we? Feel and uh, how, uh, like how do would we um, estimate or evaluate security of apps, security of this cost? Right? Visually, visually. So we the only thing how we can uh, experience safety in this in this uh, apps world is like guns, walls, gates, um, towers. So we see how uh, this is r more robust or less. It's okay. So this is this is how we would experience security, right? Yeah, please. Sorry? What about security theater? Okay, I can understand. So like pretending. Like pretending. So in this case we would be like uh, this app Castle uh, owner would be, let's say, uh, have uh, would have this um, uh, how to say tendency to fake security. But yeah, the, the point is not fake, but okay, okay, yeah. The the more I say I am strong, the, the stronger I am. This guy. This kind of thing. Uh, I don't know if it really works, um, but but some, if if you say you are strong but you are not, one one day you will pay for it, very high price. I'd say. Yeah. Um, to me, is important is that the idea is that, that when you invest in some security, to make it visual, to make it. To, pro to product type, to make robots to comprehensive and valid, like you do with the functional features. You document, you make it nice, you make it clear in order to be used. So it's again making security people a little bit more like normal feature developers, which should take, take into account. How this feature is used, uh, doing the do like design thinking, do profiling of users. Some users might have stronger security, more freedom, or some less security but more freedom. And also, let's say 
behave like you do would do the designing features and make security as a feature. And actually, it would what would what it opens, uh, what opportunity it opens. It's uh, open opportunity to resell your security investment to your end users. So if you do something, try to do it the way that it can be consumed. Not security for the security, but security for benefit of users. So that they understand, perceive uh, that this is done for me. And it helps me. Um, which is not usually the case how we do security today. Because security is a casta outside of overall feature development process very often in many organizations. Okay, um, productize. So what exactly we can do? What exactly we can do uh, to let people see that we care about security? Yeah. So I, I'm going to to show you some, give you some examples. And it would be also interesting to know how many users. So one one of the things is that, as I mentioned, you you can resell the security you, features you implement, kind of sell it to users, or if you do some kind of detections to or um, like uh, scam elaborations or uh, fraud detections for, uh, to to notify your users, right, about that, that they feel, fall to this right signal. So, uh, one example of what features you can resell is, uh, for example, many apps today implement VASP, for example, resilience requirements, which are usually done with the help of RASP technology. RASP is runtime app self-protection, and uh, this is... Uh, this kind of tool or SDK that can let up control a lot of different security controls or, uh, of operating system, of the device itself, of app itself, etc. For example, Rust can detect if user have screen lock activated or if biometrics uh, is used and activated on the device or not. So uh, this, this, is, this is a statistics like uh, twenty percent of users. Uh, don't have screen lock, and 38 percent of users doesn't have biometrics. Uh, th these users can be notified. It can be explained to them that biometrics uh, is not that something sent to the Apple machine is their fingerprint, which can be misused. So it is something good, and it's why it is good, what it, how it is really helping the security, what benefit would be if the users use. So this is something that can be communicated to see about uh, if we join this, it can be sometimes it's the same users, it's about 40 persons of users. <coughs> so if you go a little further and also include additional like uh, more technical controls on the device capabilities, hardware security chain, for example, one of the example, if uh, Google Mobile Service is enabled or not, etc. So you can see what would be the percentage of of your users if you notify them if they have something wrong. And these are actually the way, the way how you can a little bit show off of your uh, security features and the way kind of reselling. Another example that I mentioned, if you do uh, fraud detection, so your team knows what kind of scam is going on. Your team knows uh, what is popular now. What's happening? Uh, you can you can do it broadcast way. You could inform everybody, or you can really uh, notify only vulnerable categories, and and make this mes message really individual and, uh, and comprehensive, understandable for elder people, for younger people, for refugees. Just one example. I recently been attacked. So I'm, I, I live in Czech Republic. I'm Ukrainian. So I'm, I'm a foreigner there, and I got a call 
Russian-speaking guy was trying to convince me his police, uh, uh, financial department, whatever, financial monitoring, and tried to convince me to to link uh, my bank account with another device. And uh, his story around was uh, so so nice, so, so well done, so um, trustworthy. Uh, so even I had kind of doubts. Because there were a lot of details, nice stories, nice like references, etc., etc. So it was really contextual. Uh, so he just he, only only one thing he knows about me is like my name that I'm not a native Czech and uh, my phone number. It was enough for him to to try uh, to exercise me. I talked to my bank and bank said. It is ongoing scam on Ukrainian refugees. This is it because there are a big wave of Ukrainian refugees. They they are like lost. They don't know language. They don't understand the local financial traditions, how it works, etc. And um, yeah, so they say this is how it works. And bank would really benefit. So it was like disaster. A lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, exploits and. Bank would really benefit if they can share this information between them or within the community of banks and try to um, share this attack vector and communicate vulnerable particular refuses. But it's not something they did. So this is just, just an example how how this investment in security can be converted, productized to something that users can consume and uh, gain a trust to, to, to the business. Um, another aspect of, of security is report abuse. How difficult today is to report an no average big bank? You have, in best case, you have a phone number, uh, hotline where you should call if you feel like you're hacked or something. You spend like a 20 minutes listening to some IVR music and then probably somebody talk to you. Uh, and somebody not uh, really capable to understand uh, what you offer. So it's, it's, it's not security expert. We will talk to you, to the uh, person who just picking the phone up. Um, yeah, but uh, in, in a lot of apps, we already have some possibility to report abuse. So it's a really nice feature. It can be done in a very nice way. It can be really uh, it, it, it nice to have things. So it's, you feel much better when you have this, this, this such a tool that you know where to, if something goes wrong, you, you can quickly uh, report it. If you are, if you are, let's say, this castle lord, you would definitely be interested to, to have this like ringing bells in case of fire, right? <coughs> and if you are castle lord, you would definitely be happy to have your like militia, militia, so the kind of volunteers who are happy to help you with your security, who are happy to 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 be sus suspicious, to check suspicious behavior of players, of I don't know, contragents, of users, other users, uh, monitor these calls and report it, and really contribute. There are, it is really um, like um, opportunity not used if you don't tackle this free team of security enthusiasts on, on your board, which definitely every business can have. <coughs> and if you are a castle owner, you would definitely train them. You would definitely invent, invest or invest resources to make them feel... Uh, they are, they are learned, they are listened, and, and, and they are part of the team. Okay, so I'm coming to approaching two ends, or only a few topics I would like to stress here. So what is extremely important uh, nowadays, and, and very often is not really, again, not really used, is to collect this... Uh, attack vectors information. This is priceless information today. 
and it's very hard to get, especially because there is a gap, there is a like a kilometer long hole in the ground between uh, security uh, vendors which are developing tools and those who can access this information and collect, so using tools and collecting this information. But those who develop them, they need them the most because they can improve uh, uh, machine learning mechanisms. They, they can improve uh, tools uh, and use this information. Yeah? Especially if you link different uh, type of information, type of device, uh, vulnerabilities of the device, vulnerability of the operating system, user's profile, user's skills, all this aspect of this different information together linked with label exploited uh, is a priceless information, of course. Because when you, if you can collect big, uh, big collection of such uh, data points labeled with um, uh, exploited, so it is attack vector actually, uh, then you can train people, you can train machine, you can really do a lot. And of course, this information, if the, if it is shared, uh, then it's becoming so something like um, collective defense. So, and this, I believe, actually our future, so real security, may, you may see this change of this trend uh, that is shown at the beginning. Uh, I believe it will really happen when we start share the attack vector information. And this is, I think, is a big role in a role of communities here, like OWASP, for example, where this information can be aggregated, standardized, and uh, used by active players. Uh, so I have only some takeaways. Um, uh, if you want, you can make a snapshot. Of this is what I was talking about. And actually, that's it from my side. And I'm happy, happy to have you today and uh, happy for being invited and uh, talk to you today. So, thank you very much. Thank you for the amazingly insightful talk, Sagi. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Happy to have questions. Yeah. Yes, please. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no questions, anyone? Anyone? Okay, thank you very much for the amazing talk, thank and you. we hope to have you again in the future. Thank you very much. Well, my pleasure.